Okay, well, welcome back. You're still here? <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> okay, let's, let's plow on. Uh, let's start with some torque here. Uh, the easiest thing to picture as far as torque is, is intuitively is think of like a wrench in a wrench handle. Uh, you want to uh, apply a force to it. The longer the handle, the more torque you can get. Uh, you want to apply the force perpendicular to uh, this, what we, this is what we call the moment arm. And uh, we want that really force perpendicular to the handle to get a, a real torque. If the force is off at some angle, uh, then uh, you can think of this thing as being broken up into two components. A parallel, a perpendicular component, and then there could also be F parallel. And in terms of forces in the parallel direction, that's not going to lead to any kind of torque. Uh, but if we want to uh, be general about it, we put this force off in some direction. We specify theta is the angle between R and F. And then R cross F is going to be what we call the torque. Or let, I'm jumping ahead of myself here. Uh, we can get uh, the perpendicular component by saying F times the sine of theta is going to be F perpendicular. So just F times the sine of theta and that would be the torque. Uh, we can go on and formalize this more. We're not going to do too much with this, but we can say that the torque is equal to R cross F for those that have had the cross product. You were introduced to it. I, I don't think for Dr. Young's exam he's going to deal much with it. It's a powerful tool. Uh, R cross F means you put R and F tail to tail. You take your right hand and you curl it and it points in the direction of, we make it a torque vector, which would be pointing out of the board. Now the, the uh, purpose of this is that it indicates the direction of the axis of rotation. Now most everything we're doing is pretty much on a flat kind of 2D plane of the board kind of rotation. Uh, however, this is more powerful if you get something tumbling in space where you could apply a torque vector to it. It's some direction in space and that will tell you the direction that this thing is starting to want to rotate around. So this gets to be powerful, but uh, again, that's just kind of an aside. Uh, we can also rearrange something as far as calculating torques. There's a real powerful tool that uh, if you imagine the force and we say it's line of action, it would be a line that would be lining up with it. If we slid that force down, and this is kind of an imaginary one, where we're going to find a point that's along perpendicular to this line of action. And if I apply that force here, uh, I should be able to get the same torque. Let me, let me show you why that would be. If this angle's theta, this angle's theta. This distance from the point of rotation to the where we're, this line of action of the force is something we call R perpendicular. And if you look at just rearranging these terms, I can go F times R times the sine of theta and group those two terms together. R times the sine of theta is the side opposite. That's R perpendicular. So F times R perpendicular. These are three ways we can get the torque. Again, this I think is the most intuitive way you want to think. And very often this is, for most of our problems, this is kind of how we do it. Uh, this is uh, a more general. And uh, this is also uh, it's less intuitive why this works. Uh, but it's very good for doing problems. And it will be especially good uh, for when you, do, when you do get into statics problems, which luckily you don't have to do for this exam, but you will for the final. And on Monday, you'll be doing this, so he's going to sh be showing you this. But let's, uh, I just wanted to you know, do this little thing on torque. Torque is what we need to get things to rotate. Uh, so far, we've talked about things that are rotating. Uh, we dealt with that one rod that was actually affected by the torque due to gravity, but uh, let's look at this a little more generally. Let me uh, get a better color here. Rotator also stop rotating, right? Ro yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, I can change its motion. And let's say I'm, I'm going to uh, have some object here. 
Again, just kind of a generic object. I'm going to rotate it around this axis or want to rotate it around this axis uh, just for kind of conceptual clarity. May I imagine it's like a big piece of metal and it's got this axle through it. And maybe I'm going to weld a nut onto this thing and I'm going to, I'm going to have a wrench on here. And I can get this thing to start to rotate by applying a force here, a large external force and it's got some moment arm here so that it's going to give a torque to this thing that's going to want to start to rotate it. Now that force ultimately it really does come down to forces. We have a, I apply a force here that gets distributed to all these little pieces of matter in here. Let me look at a little typical piece here, a little mass uh, m sub i and it's uh, some distance r sub i away and uh, of course, I could do that for all the little pieces here. But think of like a lever-like action. This is, this is fixed. It's a rigid body. I apply a force here, and that in turn is going to apply a force out to this piece. Let me call it the F sub i piece. Okay. And uh, again, I do it for all of them. In fact, uh, this uh, net torque, which I'm calling uh, uh, F times R, well, maybe I should go R times F. Well, let me call this a capital R, just to say it's this big R times F external. And that's what we're going to apply to this thing. Gets distributed over all of these things. So we'd say the net torque is going to, again, be distributed to all of these. We'd sum up all the individual torques on, on the, all the pieces. They would, in turn, just kind of this thing in reverse, where this R uh, is related to the F and uh, I would say that R sub I times F sub I should be the torque on that individual piece. Again, this force leads to that force and all the forces that are inside there. And uh, we're going to just deal with them as a sum, breaking them down. Now you can think of the individual, individual force on this piece is going to lead to an acceleration of that piece. and. Uh, let me kind of do the acceleration off. And the acceleration would be in this direction. And uh, we can think of that uh, force as F equals MA. So that's R sub I. The uh, mass of the ith piece times the acceleration of the ith piece. And here's where we want to go back to rotational terms because they're all accelerating at different rates depending how far they are away, but they should all still have the same angular acceleration of this rigid rotating body. So if you think back in terms of our original definitions, r sub i, m sub i, uh, a sub i should be equal to r sub i times alpha. That should be this a sub i. So now what I can do is say the net torque is equal to uh, alpha should be the same for all of them. So that I can factor out. So I've got alpha times the sum of m sub i times r sub i squared. Oh, where have we seen this before? Okay, again that same pattern appears. This is what we've given it a name. Call it the moment of inertia. And so we have the net torque is equal to, we usually say i times alpha. Analogous to good old F equals MA, so again, the I is somewhat analogous to mass. It's the rotational inertia instead of the ordinary linear motion inertia. And the angular acceleration is analogous to, to acceleration. Torque is something that's analogous to force. Again, it all comes back down to forces, uh, the, uh, the, but the torques are a real good intermediate step. Applying a torque here, leading to torques on those pieces, which are really just a force here and more forces over there. Oh, uh, I. Yeah, uh, yeah, good question. That's the external force. So, yeah, sorry, I get kind of sloppy and it wasn't all that important. Uh, okay, so that's the basic idea. Um, uh, so if we want to get something to accelerate, uh, we need to apply a torque to it and that will be its acceleration. Uh, let's see, is there anything else I want to say right now about that? Okay, I think we can actually uh, do some things without... Uh, going into more detail. Let's, let's uh, work a problem. 
Uh, let's jump into a, a fairly meaty one here. Let's let's go look at let's look at number five on the practice problems. And that's uh, that's where we have a big disc. We've got a couple masses here sitting here on a table, and another mass here. Let me, uh, I, I'm going to kind of do this kind of a little more generically. You've got all my numbers in my notes there as far as the actual numbers. Let's kind of look at the strategy on what we're going to do for this thing. Uh, let's call this one M1. Let's call this one M2. Uh, let's just call this uh, disc a big M. Okay, and it's going to be fixed here so it doesn't, uh, doesn't go anywhere. Okay, and we, uh, we're going to start from rest, or actually it doesn't even matter because the question is what is the acceleration of the block? So even if they were moving, uh, the acceleration should be uh, the same whether they're in motion. Uh, the acceleration should be also a constant. Uh, so it is possible to do this problem with energy principles, but uh, let's, let's, since we're talking about torque, let's take a look at that. Okay, what we're going to end up doing is... Uh, I could draw free body diagrams, but with the colored, uh, and that's kind of separating these things. We've got this one's mass. Let me just kind of lay the forces in on top of the diagram and see if we can keep things straight. I'm going to have, this is going to be M1G, gravity pulling here. Uh, the string pulls back with a tension, let's say T1. Um, uh, and if this thing is going to go down, is that tension equal to the weight? Okay, yeah, don't make that mistake. If it was, it's not going anywhere. Only if it's hanging there is that true. That tension, action, reaction, is a tension applied up on the, the uh, pulley. And uh, now uh, notice I'm calling it a T1 and not just a T. Because now we have, what it's a real massive pulley. It's got mass to it. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, going to take something to get it to rotate. We still, it is still frictionless, but it's uh, it's not massless. The string is going to move over it, and it's not going to slip on there, and so it's going to move with the string, uh, and uh, there, there will be a difference in the tensions, as you'll see. Uh, there'll be a tension up on this guy, T, we'll call that T2, and that's going to pull back on the block this way, T, uh, T2 here. Uh, also, this one has gravity, M2G, uh, also has a normal force. Uh, we don't have any friction, uh, but that would be sort of all our forces applied there. And we're going to do, uh, you could even draw these as free bodies, but let's, uh, let's again, I'm going to just kind of superimpose them all. I hope you're getting sophisticated enough to see these ideas. When you're solving this, it's very important. It's, it could be very easy to mess up on signs. I think the clearest way you want to do this is to set a direction of motion for the system you want to call positive motion, and the other would be negative. So in other words, this one could go down, we could call that positive, it means that one goes up, and that this one rotates this way, or we could have it go the other way. Um, I don't know why, I, uh, I'm, I'm just going to uh, choose for myself, I'll just say that this is positive going this way. And that implies that if this rotates, this is positive, okay? And that means this thing goes up, and I'll call that the positive direction. So this is very handy because we're going to write a set of equations for each of these, and we've got to be able to relate them together. And so we want our signs working together, and this is the best way to avoid problems. So for this one, I'm going to do the sum of the forces on, on this object. I, I'm calling down positive, so I would say this is going to be M1G that goes in as positive, minus T1, and then that should be equal to M1 times the acceleration. And so that's going to be kind of my first, first equation. Of course, there's an unknown here, assuming I have the masses and I know G, uh, I, I don't know the tension and I don't know the acceleration. Uh, this one, uh, let's lay our x-axis, well I guess I'm calling this direction positive, so I guess this is the plus x. Uh, I could also do the y motion, and, but there's, uh, actually there's no point in doing the y since there's no friction involved. I don't really need to know the normal force. 
but uh, certainly gravity I'm going to need to break up into a component. Hopefully you're good with these now that this would be angle theta. And so when I put this in here, I'm going to have a component down, which is going to be M2G times uh, the side opposite, that's times the sine of theta. Hopefully you got that good now. And so if I write this as the sum of the forces acting on it, uh, call, again calling up positive, that's going to be T2 minus M2G times the sine of theta. And that should be equal to F equals MA, this one's mass. M2 times its acceleration. Uh, I do expect that these two are going to accelerate together, that the string's not going to stretch or anything, anything complicated, that they will move together. Uh, so I, I can go ahead and make that substitution. So that part's pretty much old stuff. You've dealt with that before. Other than this T1 and T2 stuff, uh, in the past we just called it T and then we could solve between these two equations what's going on. We have the added complication we have to deal with this guy. Um, and uh, we'll look at this. Now this is a rotation, so instead of some of the forces, we're going to do some of the torques. And that should be equal to I times alpha. And uh, the torques, we're going to want to watch the sign on these things. I'm calling this direction positive. So anything that wants to get it to rotate this direction, we'll call a positive torque. And so I expect that T1 is going to want to get it to rotate this way. T2 would want to get it to rotate the opposite way. So the sum of those two torques uh, will be, I'll call it T1 times the radius, uh, I'll just call it radius R here times the radius r, that's a positive torque. They are at right angles, so think about back to this, it's just the perpendicular component to r, so I don't need to do anything fancy with signs or anything. Uh, and holding the back is going to be minus T2 times r, and that's the, those are the net torques. That should be equal to the moment of inertia of this thing, I'll just call it i for now. And then it's alpha, this, uh, that. Okay, now I could do something here. I could say, well, T1 minus T2, and I could factor out an R. And I, if this was like a big disk, uh, moment of inertia of a disk, that would be one half m r squared. I want to relate it to the acceleration. Now I'm assuming that the string isn't slipping on here. And then I would expect that if it doesn't slip, Alpha times R should be equal to A tangential. And as long as it doesn't slip, that A tangential is equal to A. So this is the part where it doesn't, no slipping. Okay. Uh, what I'll do is say that this is going to, alpha is going to be A over R. And uh, then I can cancel some things. One of these R's goes out, and this pattern often shows up. That goes out, and you end up with simply T1 minus T2 is equal to 1 half big M times A. Got that equation. And so now we actually have our three equations, and that's all we need to uh, be able to get at it. Uh, now, <clears throat> from these two, where we have T2 and uh, A is unknown, I guess what I'd do for solving this, depending how you want to approach it, uh, this has, in a sense, all three variables, T1, T2, and A that I don't know. Each of these only have two. What I would do is uh, maybe solve this one for T1, and I think I'll just kind of outline it here. So, uh, the rest is really math. T1, solve for that. That can come back up into here. This equation I'd solve for T2 and find and then end up sticking that back up into here. Then I should be able to go through and solve for what the acceleration is. And again, you can see my, no my notes for details, but I wanted to kind of get this big picture look. And again, the careful focus on this new component in these force diagrams are going to be this, this idea of the tension. Okay, let's uh, do, uh, yeah. Sorry, where did you come up with the A over R for the? Oh, for alpha? Yeah. Uh, I should have had a capital R here, but uh, let's see. 
alpha times r is the tangential acceleration. So this thing uh, is ro rotating and it has a tangential acceleration and that as long as there's no slipping should match the acceleration of the others. Okay, so that's, yeah, okay, a lot, a lot of issues to, uh, to do, deal with there. Okay, and, and, and because of that, I'm able to get at alpha, okay? Okay, uh, let's see, kind of in the interest of time. I thought that I threw one here on the extra problems. Some of these extra problems are the more tough ones. Uh, so ask to get, get, some, get some meaty ones on here. If you look at number three, uh, maybe I'll just uh, look, let's take a look at what's important in this problem. Yeah, take a brief look at that while I erase the board. And you see the little complication with this, uh, this idea of this roller has, has kind of a tape wrapped around it. Okay, I think this, this was just a semester or two ago that he did this one. Uh, you might want to consider. Now, this pulley up here is actually a, a massless, frictionless pulley. Uh, that, that, that is our back to our old ideal pulley. Uh, this guy here, this roller that's going to be rolling down the incline has some tape and the tape is wrapped around it and goes back up whoop, over this roller very nicely and then it comes down to a block and uh, the part that's a bit tricky here is uh, again this uh, This is really a massless, frictionless pulley. You should have specified that a little more, but there's idea there that there will be a tension here, and that tension will come back and be applied over here. Okay? And uh, there is also... Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm realizing it's been a while since I looked at this, uh, this one. There's, uh, there's some subtlety in this one. Um, we can do it a, a couple different ways. I think uh, people are most happy with, uh, we'll do the rotation around the center of this thing as this thing rotates. And uh, there's going to be also, uh, this thing doesn't want to just slip down. The friction also is helping to take and roll this thing. So there's going to be some friction at the bottom so it doesn't slip. We need that. And uh, there's also gravity pulling down on this thing, mg. Okay, so this, this guy's a little bit tricky. Uh, you want to look at, as this thing goes down, there's, there's going to be a relationship here. Uh, let's, call this, uh, let's call this m2. And there's going to be an m2g. And uh, let's just call this, well, let's, go, ah, I'll call, let's call this big m. Since this is the <coughs> big, this is the big guy. Let's see, we'll just call it little M there. Okay. Okay. Now uh, there's going to be a little bit of a trickiness here, as far as how this thing moves. Now, in fact, this part of it, I think I'm going to put it over here because I get too much on the diagram. It's a little hard to see. The idea is that, let's say the roller was here, and it's going to roll down to some final position. Not necessarily some final position, but let's say it just moves through some distance, let's say x1. Okay, now the tape that was attached to that up here had to also get pulled down this distance <coughs> down to here. Let me, in fact, let me do it in a different color here had to get pulled down a distance x1. Now it didn't just, we didn't just pull it down a bit, we also rolled it. And as it rolled, it rolled up some of the, of the tape. So this amount that we pulled down, if it didn't slip and it rolled, it's going to roll an additional x1. Can you see that? 
Okay, kind of tricky. Yeah, again, uh, you think of it in two parts where I just take and pull this thing down to here, stretches that much. Where did it, it did? It ended up pulling this guy up, uh, as, uh, uh, this block up, had to go up x1. But in that process of moving it, it also rolled, and it rolled up an additional thing. Since it's rolled x this, x1, it rolled an amount x1. And so that, too, would pull this thing up. And so when this, uh, yeah, excuse me, that's x2. When, when this guy moved x1, this guy actually moved twice as far. Excuse me, I'm, x2 is equal to 2 times x1. That's what I'm trying to say. Now, if you, if you can kind of see that, that's the trickiest part to this problem that kind of derails students, and you can see why that they kind of get blown away by that. Uh, he's had some similar things here, uh, and I hope this explanation is reasonable. It's, it's a little hard to arm, arm wave. But if you can see it in terms of displacements, that you can see that the motion of this one will be twice what this one is. As this one goes down a certain x, this goes up 2x. Then you can also get at velocities. Uh, if the displacement is twice what it was, I expect v2 to be twice the velocity of v1. And also, in the same time that they move, uh, they would also, we could describe the acceleration. The acceleration of 2 should be 2 times the acceleration of 1. Okay, so that's the kind of a simple kinematic look of that part of the problem. Whew, so that's uh, a bit tricky. Okay, so now when we go to do this problem, okay, we, uh, we can again focus on this. We can say, okay, this thing's going to go down, so let's call this the plus direction. That means this is going to go up. That's the plus direction. So I'll do some of the forces here. That's going to be uh, 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 T uh, minus mg, and then that should be equal to this mass, small m, times its acceleration, and let's draw a distinction. Let's call that A2. It's going to go up A2 as this one goes down A1. And again, A2 will be equal to 2 times A1. Okay, subtle issues. Okay, on this one, now we can <coughs> look at this and uh, look at the uh, sum of the forces. And uh, can do, uh, yeah, we've got some of the forces. Some of the forces, I'm calling this the positive direction. Uh, I hope this is okay if I'm at angle theta here. This is angle theta. Let me write it out and see if you agree. You should be have pretty comfortable with this kind of stuff by now. But we're going to have gravity is going to be pulling us down, so that's going to be big, big mg times the sine of theta is uh, pulling us down. Uh, the thing that's pulling us back is, well, this friction is holding us back, causing us to roll. Also, tension is holding us back. And uh, that should be equal to big M times A1, that acceleration. Okay? Now, hmm? Uh, this is the forces I'm calling in the plus, or let's say x direction, I'm going to call it this, this direction is going to be plus x, if that's okay. I'm just laying my axes down here. I, I, I'm, uh, I, I could go in in the y and get my normal force, but I'm just going to solve for friction. I'm just going to call it friction. The thing is, I'm going to need, I don't know what friction is. Uh, now, the thing is, I also needed to be able to rotate, so there's a subtlety here. This will be the uh, sum of the torques, and I'll do the torques around the center. That should be equal to I alpha, and the sum of the torques on this thing, getting it to rotate. Um, one, you've got, well, mg goes right through the very center, so is that going to give it a torque around the center? Not around the center, uh, but there will be a torque due to the tension. And now that wants to keep us, hold us back. It wants us to get it to roll uphill. So that's going to be a minus torque, T times the radius of this thing. 
Um, the friction is wanting us to get us to rotate this way, and wow, that would want us to get us to roll down the track, so that would be a plus F times R. A little note uh, that maybe I'm not quite sure which way the friction is pointing. Uh, actually, I don't need to know. The, the math will tell me, and if I'm guessing wrong that it's, uh, I have it going up, the math should solve and tell me that it's negative. Uh, I have a negative F here indicating in the forces, I have it in that direction, and I, have, I, and I indicate it there, so I'm okay there. And in this case, in the rotational sense, that's giving me a rotation this way, uh, that would be a, a, a come going as a positive. Uh, those are the only th two things leading to rotation. That should equal to I times uh, alpha. Now we can recast this a bit when we. Uh, what is it? Plus FR? Oh, FR? Okay, uh, look at that force. It, we're talking about the torque around, I should say, we emphasize this is around the center of mass of this wheel. And ask yourself, uh, as you look at that, if you were to pull in that direction, which way does it want to rotate? Okay, yeah, it wants to rotate this way. This is wanting to ro rotate down the hill in what I'm calling the positive direction. So, uh, whereas tension wanted to get it to rotate the other way. So, rather than look which way the thing forces, uh, when you're dealing with torque, say, which way does this want to get it to rotate? Yeah, so it wants to rotate this way, and that I'm, that I'm calling anything this direction, hence, oh, excuse me, then this would be positive rotation. Is it positive because it's counterclockwise? Oh, okay, I'm, I'm in a sense setting my sign conventions. Uh, now, if you want to follow, uh, you're thinking maybe in a math, in math course they always have, uh, well, I think this would even follow a math definition that we would say that counterclockwise would be, with the right ho hand rule, is, is positive. But uh, I think uh, because signs can be so tricky, I would, I would say uh, in a problem, indicate for the system what you want to call positive direction. And it's your choice. Uh, and it, but once you set that, you stay with it in terms of the signs. And then when you go ahead and solve, you might get negatives for those. And that just tells you it's pointing the other way. And that can very well be, yeah. So you said the totally is turning counterclockwise. So wouldn't your FR be negative in that sense? Um, okay, it's, it's wanting to rotate in that direction, so um, in terms of this thing rolling down the incline, it would be rolling like this. Oh, so it's still moving down, okay. Yeah, and so you're pulling this way. Yeah, yeah you want to be very careful. Envision a rotation. Uh, usually you can do it intuitively, but just imagine it pinned there, and if you pull, you say, which way does it want to rotate? It should go that way. And all of these problems, you can really get nailed with just a miss sign, and you just you 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 blow it. Um, okay, now between these two, uh, this this idea of this disc, I've got I've got both of these things going on. Uh, what we don't know, I don't know what that frictional force is. Uh, in the problem, as he states it, he gives you the masses of the disc. He gives you the mass of the block. He gives you, uh, he d but he doesn't give you the frictional force. And I need it both here and here. I don't need it over here. So what you want to do between these two equations, and maybe I'll just kind of make a note, and, and you need to pick through this carefully for yourself. You want to eliminate F between these two equations. Solve one for F and stick back into the other. It's, it's a bit messy, so I don't want to go through all the details. Of there. They're in my notes. But solve for F between these two. Um, oh, one other thing. Uh, uh, this alpha, maybe I, I will do one more step here. This On this side is the I is going to be I of a disk, so that's going to be one half big M times R squared. Yeah, let me do one more thing here. Uh, in this equation, this is minus T R plus F R. Alpha, if it's not going to slip, should be equal to A1 over R. Okay, so that's alpha. 
And then with the same trick here, this R will knock off with one of these. These guys knock off with this. And so actually this isn't too bad. That's minus T plus F is equal to one half M A1. Okay, so I guess the, I'd say between these two equations, eliminate F. That's, this isn't too bad here. You've got an F here. It'd be far, fairly easy to solve for. You could stick it back into here. Uh, maybe I will do that. It's not too much to do. Uh, this F would come back up into this one. So this equation would be, uh, would be mg sine theta minus F. And the minus F would be one half m a one plus t, uh, bringing that over to the other side. So that's F, then minus t, and then that's uh, m a one. Ooh, that's uh, kind of nice. We've got a plus t and a minus t. These are going to go out. So actually, that looks pretty clean. Uh, oh, yeah. Excuse me. Never mind. That looks too convenient. Yeah, that has to be distributed. Thanks for catching that. Uh, so things don't look, I guess, so nice. This is going to be a minus two. Um, do the, uh, you can do the algebra. But essentially, we're going to have this thing that came from the, the force and the, the uh, rotation together, eliminating between them uh, the friction coming back to here and then on this other object the block we've got this so I've got this equation this equation and then also this one with relating the accelerations and then we can solve for the acceleration okay uh, I did uh, people wanted some gnarly ones so I, th I thought well these are the ones that are pretty gnarly so I'll let you chew on this for a little bit there's a lot to be seen here I got my notes, so we've got a lot of ground even yet to cover, so let's, uh, I'll just tease you with that one. Okay, um, okay, there's one other issue we, we, should, we should end with, and that's angular momentum. <laughs> okay, one more. And uh, let me start over here. Anybody still standing? It's a lot of stuff this time of year, huh? Okay. Oh. <clears throat> okay. Let's uh, let's do angular momentum. Okay, and. In a sense, we're, we're going to just define this mathematically, and then we'll have to, of course, see whether it's going to be a worthwhile thing. We give it an L uh, for angular momentum. I don't know why. Uh, and then that's going to be defined as uh, R cross momentum, R cross, or sometimes we'll say R cross MV. And this is the kind of formal definition. Um, usually we'll do it in terms of uh, the absolute value. We can do it mostly as a scalar for the most part and that's going to be R times MV times the sine of the angle between them. That's with the cross product. And uh, Okay, uh, there's several things we should probably look at right off hand and this is something that gets used a great deal in problems and it's very kind of counterintuitive. You think of angular momentum, you picture something going around in a circle. How about if you have some mass that's just traveling along, let's say just through space, and it's just going to continue on a straight line. It's not going to change its velocity, good old conservation of uh, momentum, it just shing, goes through space. Okay, does it have angular momentum? wouldn't think so. You say, hey, you know, it's just going in a straight line. But we can still, we, we do this, actually I should have put a 3 here, that indicates this is just a definition. And we can just go ahead and say, well, I can use that definition. It has momentum, mv, uh, 
and uh, whoa, let's see, r, we have to specify some point. We always do the angular momentum about some point p. And uh, you can choose any point you want. There's, there's times where some points are more convenient. We'll look at those. Uh, if we choose just some arbitrary point here, p, and I want to get the angular momentum, imagine you're sitting at p and you watch this thing go by. Uh, in a sense, it does have some angular momentum in that it's changing angle with you. As it goes racing by, you know, when, you're, when it's out here traveling along with some, some momentum here, it's got some radius that we would say, okay, this is the radius out to here, r. And then uh, it also has an angle. When we put, deal with the angle between mv and, and r, we put them tail to tail. So formally, r points right out to this guy. It's its position vector. And the angle between them is uh, this angle theta. And if we uh, look at what's going to happen with this, uh, there's, there's going to be a perpendicular distance. Uh, it looks pretty bad. Look at that. I'm drawing from the slant here. And this is what I'm going to call r perpendicular because this angle theta is, of course, the same as that angle theta. And r perpendicular is just r times the sine of theta is r perpendicular. So if you look back up at this idea that the angular momentum here about this point is, is r times mv times the sine of the angle, what's really handy to see is that you can go mv times r times the sine of theta and group those two terms together. r times the sine of theta is r perpendicular. So mv times r perpendicular is that angular momentum around that point. Now, what you need to see is that, wow, that applies even if he, as it shoots out here. R gets to be greater. Uh, out, out this way, it would be R would be much greater. But that angle between them, theta, is getting smaller and smaller. Now, if you look at this, we can play this game with R perpendicular, R sine theta, for any position along here. So actually, we can say that angular momentum is conserved for this thing, according to our definition. It should just be mv times r perpendicular. The line of action of this thing as it travels through space. And if I want to get the angular momentum of that thing coming in from this point, all I need to do is look at this distance and take it times that. I don't need to sit and figure out what r is and what, ang what theta is. I can get it immediately from here. And uh, this is something we're definitely going to likely see in, in a problem. And we'll, we'll look at some here in a moment. Um, let's uh, look at just a rotating object here for a moment. Um, so that one's a bit counterintuitive. Something that's more intuitive is something that's rotating. And if you picture something rotating around some axle and uh, again you think of this thing as made up of a whole bunch of pieces it has some velocity this is of the kth piece um, it's got some radius and uh, uh, certainly some momentum maybe I should just say mv and r cross mv if we if we look at uh, the angular momentum of this thing and also in terms of its magnitude, r times mv, and oh, r times mv times the sine of the angle, in this case it's going to be 90 degrees, okay? As it rotates, all of these things, their velocities are always, all of these pieces, no matter where we're at here, their velocities are going to be at right angles, always moving to the radius as this thing rotates. This is always 90 degrees, and therefore that's 1. And uh, r times mv. r cross mv would be a vector that would be pointing out of the page. The advantage of talking about this as a vector is uh, this indication that all of these things, uh, for all of these things, are pointing in the same direction. The angular momentum vector points in the direction along the axis of rotation. And the right-hand rule will tell you how this thing is rotating. So it's rotating on this axis like this, coming around. Uh, we say usually it just has some omega. 
uh, but it's implied that its, uh, it's axis is this way by this, this cross product. We're going to get formal with this. But for the most part, our stuff is rotating in kind of a 2D plane, and we don't need to worry too much about the formalism. Uh, we can get, uh, the, this is the angular momentum for every little piece. The idea, if I wanted the angular momentum for a system, uh, L for the system, in this case, uh, it's all of the pieces of this thing. It's going to be the sum of all the little angular momentums of all the pieces. Uh, the angular momentums of the pieces are going to be the, uh, the uh, R sub i times M sub i times V sub i. Uh, here again, the idea that V sub i, the velocity, should be equal to R sub i times omega, the angular velocity. And so we can end up with R sub i times M sub i times V sub i is R sub i times omega. Uh, I can factor out an omega and I'm left with the sum of M sub i times R sub i squared. Wow, see that again. Okay, and then that's the angular momentum of that system or that, that rotating disk. So we can call that i times omega. And so the angular momentum for something that's a rigid body and rotating is, uh, in, uh, compare that to ordinary momentum, is mv. Again, the, the mass and the rotational inertia are very, uh, very much analogous. The velocity and the angular velocity are analogous. And the angular momentum and the momentum are related to these things in this way. Uh, so this is handy. Um, now you can mix and match things. A lot of these things you'll have some projectile being fired in and hitting something, causing something to rotate. And the angular momentum is best thought of this way. If it's a rigid body and rotating, it's probably best to think of the angular momentum that way. Uh, so let's, uh, let's, put it to, let's put it to use here. Uh, I had, uh, let's see, I want to do... Well, let's, let's, uh, let's take a look at number six on the uh, practice problems. And I think I'll erase this if it's okay. Uh, uh, oh, okay, I'll leave that. Okay. Okay. Okay, are we doing okay? We're, we're almost there. I know this is, this is the most grueling uh, one of all. Uh, we've got this number six. Uh, we're going to have a ruler come up, or let's see, it's going to have a collision, a meter stick. Ah, we all know how long that is. And, uh, yeah, you're all right. And we've got a clay ball, a 0.5 kilogram clay ball. It's traveling uh, with three meters per second. And this meter stick is traveling at four meters per second. They're going to collide here. And uh, the collision is perfectly inelastic. The clay sticks to the meter stick. Okay, and they want to know the linear speed, the angular speed, and the direction of travel after collision. Okay, uh, so here's the basic picture. Uh, Okay, so you've got this uh, clay ball coming in, and this is coming up, and they're going to smack into one another, stick, a little more elegantly than that. And then they're going to start to rotate. But, uh, wow, let's see, what applies here in this, uh, this collision? Does conservation of linear momentum apply? Yes. No, linear no. It's Strictly? Or maybe they both apply. Okay, uh, first of all, these things collide. Uh, there's forces between them. Okay, uh, when we get into rotation, we will. And, and so hang on to that. We'll, we'll deal with that. But for right now, uh, are the forces strictly between them? Are there any external forces? So if there's no external forces, what about linear momentum? It's conserved. It's not zero. We had momentum to begin with, right? So we're, momentum's conserved, and so uh, 
that's going to hold. Uh, then the idea, it's also going to say, well, there's, since the forces are internal, there can't be any external torques, obviously. So there will be uh, conservation of angular momentum. Okay, so the thing's going to rotate. Um, the thing is, it's not going to just sit and rotate in a single point in space. It's going to start to move. And in fact, you may want to think these two things are coming in. I expect with, with momentum, aren't they going to take off in that direction? So these things are going to collide. They're going to do that. They're going to take off. Or what, what, what's going to take off in a straight line? Center of mass is going to take off in a straight line. And it's going to be rotating around that point. Okay, so he wants to know all of this thing. He wants to know uh, what are the linear speed, that is the motion of the center of mass, the angular speed, and then the direction after the collision, that is the direction of the center of mass, the path of that. Okay, so this is uh, a lot going on. If it, was, if it was stuck on, let's say, on the board, the linear momentum would be, doesn't exist. Okay, uh, if this was somehow stuck, in fact, uh, the next problem, number seven, uh, is pinned on the bottom, and that will be a case where, uh, where we'd say linear momentum will not be conserved. Okay, so uh, good point. But for this one, we would say that it uh, would be. In fact, we have to deal with that. And uh, so let's kind of look at the kind of the before picture. Uh, this is the before picture as they're coming in and uh, the after picture let's look at it uh, just as they're kind of meeting uh, they're going to come in the clay ball is going to get stuck on top the meter stick is going to get stuck into it and uh, there's uh, it sort of makes sense that the center of mass is going to be here somewhere between the two um, and uh, this whole thing is going to be rotating with some final angular velocity and uh, momentum again they've got momentum this way it's coming in it's going to strike and I expect the center of mass is going to take off with some velocity velocity of the center of mass and then also it's going to take off at some angle and we need to know all three of those things okay and uh, let's see we had 0.5 kilograms let me get uh, a little more, the meter stick is 0.25 kilograms. Okay. Okay, so uh, probably the first thing to deal with is maybe just conservation of momentum. Uh, maybe I can just kind of put that over here. Uh, uh, so momentum. Um, okay, and we have momentum in both the X and the Y. So the... Uh, Momentum in the X is, uh, let's see, the linear momentum is going to be 0.5 kilograms times 3 meters per second. And that's coming in that way. Uh, the final is going to be the two of them together. So it's going to be uh, 0.75 kilograms. They're stuck together, right? So that's the final mass uh, times the velocity of the center of mass. I'll just call it V times the cosine of theta. Okay, does that make sense? And then uh, the momentum in the y is going to be uh, just this guy, which is going to be 0.25 kilograms times 4 meters per second. Uh, and then that's times, uh, again, 0.75 kilograms times the v times the sine of theta. We've got two equations, two unknowns. Uh, you can see my notes. Uh, we can get V and we can get theta from that. So that's relatively straightforward, but it's an important idea that you should be able to get that out of there. Uh, the more tricky one is getting how this thing is rotating around the center of mass. And so the first thing we need to do is locate that center of mass. And uh, Let's see, I've got a little different color here. We need to find that center of mass. Now, uh, when I talked about center of mass, uh, let's say, let me just write it out here. The Y center of mass is equal to, uh, because we're playing with that, the X center of mass is obviously got to be somewhere in here. Uh, but the Y center of mass is what's tricky. Should be equal to the sum of these two things, uh, their masses and their uh, individual Ys 
all over the total mass, uh, some of all the masses. Uh, for us, we've just got two of these things. Now, we uh, I wanted to warn you at first, it depends where you want to have your origin because everything gets measured relative to that. And uh, we can make our origin wherever we want. Um, how about if I, let me just propose one, how about if I make my origin like right at the clay ball? So this would be my X, this would be my Y, everything would be measured from here. Is that okay? Uh, can I? Okay, I don't have to. You, if you want to play it somewhere else, it works out fine. And I think in my notes, I have it differently. Uh, but let me go ahead and play with this, uh, kind of more in the interest of time. Um, we're going to have the mass of this piece, which is uh, 0.5 kilograms. Its Y value is, according to what I've got, is zero. Okay, it can be an advantage to that. Uh, plus the mass of this stick, oh, 0.25, and what, uh, where, what is its position? Oh, I mean, it's a whole meter stick, right? Okay, so what do I use for that? Yeah, that particular piece, its own center, just so the meter stick alone is in the center of the stick. Uh, so the idea would be, I'd say, well, that's going to be the mass of the meter stick, but the distance is going to be, well, one half a meter. Okay? okay and again, that's the center of the stick. Center of mass of stick. Okay, that's how we play the game. And then we take that over the total mass, so that's going to be 0.75. And so my choice of zero up here is a, is a bit handy, but uh, it's, 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 it's kind of nice. And then, uh, uh, so we're going to end up with about a third, this will be a one third of 0.5, or that's going to be one sixth of a meter is going to be the position of Y center of mass. And so this center of mass is going to be here and I expect that to be and that again is measured relative to my origin from here down to here well that distance is going to be one-sixth of a meter okay uh, my notes I, I I think I chose a different point uh, I think it might have been this one to do my measurement from and it leads to a little clumsiness so a, a strategic choice of where to measure from can be handy that one sixth of a meter here too is going to be handy that center of mass was here which if I projected back to my beginning picture here's the center of mass of this of the system when they're going to collide so now let's go back in time a little bit when they collide and collide, they're going, to, they're going to match here. They're going to start to rotate. Here, they're both headed this way. The center of mass is here. So by the time they get here, this guy's up into here, and the center of mass is here. But now I want you to think. We need to get uh, the idea here oh, from now, from this before picture to this after picture. What, do, what principle do we want to use? Conservation of angular momentum, right? Okay, that's what we're playing with. There's no external torques. And so I expect that, uh, that from conservation, uh, angle, uh, ang final, or initial angular momentum is going to be equal to the final angular momentum. And this is of the system. Now, now, keep in mind, we've got these two things coming in here. So we have to actually get the angular momentum before uh, so we want to be careful here. What is the angular momentum before? Well, keep in mind this idea. Something traveling in a straight line. The angular momentum of that is just, if we want to get it around any point in space, it's the perpendicular distance from that point to that line of action. And that is uh, going to be uh, what we're going to use for angular momentum. So let me write that up for this guy. That's going to be uh, uh, 0.5 kilograms times uh, times its uh, velocity, times 3 meters per second, times r. And what is r going to be? Okay, it's going to ultimately rotate around the center of mass. That's point P. So that perpendicular distance is one, yeah, one-sixth of a meter. 
Okay, tricky business. Yeah. Okay, plus now, the, oh, we also have this uh, meter stick. That's 0.25 kilograms. It's traveling at four meters per second. And, uh, oh, what's its perpendicular distance? Okay, it's traveling along here, so its line of action is going right through the center of mass. Yeah, it's going to be zero. Okay, again, keep in mind, this one I drew this way, it's a little harder, easier to see the one on top, that it's this perpendicular distance, but it was the distance from the line of action to the point in, in question. Here, the line of action, this meter stick was moving this way. It was headed right straight through the center of mass, and so it doesn't contribute to any, any angular momentum around that point. So that's zero. The final angular momentum is, uh, at least in principle, is a little easier to get. You've got the two of these things rotating, uh, that should be equal to, oh, be careful, this is going to be I of the system times the uh, final angular velocity. And we're almost there, we just need to get that final angular velocity. But we have one more thing in the way, and that's the I of the system. Okay, uh, what, what, is, uh, what is rotating here? We've got a meter stick, is it rotating around its center? Yeah, it's rotating around a point up here. And uh, the, the uh, clay ball is, is uh, also rotating around that point. Uh, he's, I think uh, the clay ball is implied that it's, it's, he doesn't give you a real dimension, so I don't think you need to think of it like a sphere. I think you can think of it as a small little teeny glob. And uh, so let me uh, guide you in that. <clears throat> I expect that uh, the ruler should be, let me write it out, 1 12th and see if you agree. It's going to be the mass of the ruler was 0.25. Okay, I've got the 1 12th. This is going to be around its center uh, times its uh, length, which is 1 meter. That's going to be squared. Plus, all of this is the ruler, the parallel axis theorem. It'll be the mass of this meter stick, 0.25 kilograms times this distance from its center of mass to the, uh, the, uh, bleh, this, uh, the actual center of mass that it's rotating. So D is measured there. Let's see, that's 0.5 or a half minus a sixth is uh, two sixths. So that's going to be times uh, two sixths of a meter. Did I? Um, okay, it, we want to get uh, this distance from its center to here, so that's, that's a half a meter up to here, subtracting a sixth of that, so one half, that's not right, yeah, three six. yeah, two six. yeah, help me, guide me if I mess up, because I, these are the kinds of things I blow. Uh, that's going to be squared. So this is, this, all of this is the, is the stick or the ruler, okay? And that's, this is the parallel axis theorem, parallel axis. Uh, then we just need to add on the clay ball, and I think he's just dealing with that as a point mass since he doesn't give us any dimension to it or shape to it. So I'm just going to say that's going to be the mass of this thing, which was 0.5 times the distance to the, uh, this is going to be a one-sixth uh, meter, and that's going to be squared. So that's just an MR squared for that. And uh, that's going to be I of the system. We'll be able to put it back into there and solve for omega final. Uh, what was the other point? Five plus one-sixth? Uh, this, this is the uh, clay ball. Okay, both of those are going to be rotating at the end. Uh, they're both rotating around this point. So this is just, think of this as like a point mass going around in a circle. And this guy's rotating around there. Okay, a lot of little pieces that you need to put together. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me just, uh, okay. let me allude to one more here. Uh, in fact, uh, maybe... Uh, 
Let me just give a couple tips on it. Number seven is uh, kind of a nice contrast to number six. Um, let me, okay, you've learned your lesson here, right? Oh, I'm, I, excuse me, did I answer it? Did we answer everything for that question? Uh, from conservation of momentum, we should be able to get the velocity, okay. at the angle. So that's that, and then this is the rotational part. So we get our three pieces, and that will describe the motion, how it takes off through space and how it's rotating. Kind of like Don throwing the hammer here. Yeah. Okay, uh, okay, this number seven, let me just point out with some key differences here in this kind of problem. Uh, this one is pinned here. So at the pin here, uh, there is a possibility that there, in fact, it is likely that there is forces holding this thing in here. So there could be a uh, force in the X and a force in the Y. Um, what would be nice, uh, so is, is, first of all, can, is conservation of momentum going to hold? Yeah, no, we got external forces. Uh, how about conservation of angular momentum? Okay, uh, about any point or? Okay, we, we need to have no external torques. Okay, now, we, uh, now if we do the rotation around this point here, point P, uh, is there any, can these forces give you any torque? Okay, so if we deal with our angular momentum around this point, and we do want to choose this point, then we can claim, hey, we don't need to worry about these forces because the moment arm is zero, there's no way they can give us any kind of torque. So then we can say, well, we can use conservation of momentum on the problem, and uh, He's, he's going to send in the clay ball. It's going to bounce off at, uh, let me just kind of, the main points on this. Coming in at 45, this thing's coming in, I think, what, 10 meters per second. Uh, this is what he's headed along, this line. This thing is at rest. So this is the kind of before picture. Uh, the after picture is uh, this, this rod is going to be rotating with some omega which we'll need to find. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the ball was going off here at 10 meter, uh, 5 meters per second. So, now the thing is, uh, you want to deal with the angular momentum. Again, this is something that's traveling, to look at along its line of action is, uh, is its momentum. If we want to get the angular momentum around this point, what we want to get is this perpendicular distance. So we want this r perpendicular. And uh, this stick, I think this wasn't a meter stick. This was uh, some rod, 1.25 centimeters. So, but anyway, let's just call it L. So this is L over 2. And uh, this was 45 degrees. So from this, you can get r, r perpendicular is going to be L over 2 times the sine or cosine of 45 degrees. Okay, and so this would be just mv times that would be an angular momentum. Look at the way this thing wants to kind of rotate the direction of angular momentum. This is coming in this way. Uh, uh, in a sense, you, if you're around this point, you can think of this thing as wanting to, in a sense, kind of rotate, or and it's going to ultimately get this thing to rotate in this direction. Um, we can, you can choose any direction you want as positive, but let's say uh, I choose that this thing is positive in this direction. It's coming in, it's rotating this way, and ultimately it's going to rotate that. This one coming back out uh, is going to be coming out later, is going to bounce after it bounces off of here with a lesser velocity. This is going to have, uh, in a sense, a wanting to rotate in the opposite direction around this thing. Um, okay, uh, do you kind of get a uh, gist of where I'm going with it? I, I don't want to take the time to fill in all the details, but just kind of point out some of the things you want to look at. Um, one other problem I, I threw, uh, again, I'll just allude to it, uh, is this on the uh, extra problems, number four. Uh, he glues together four rods, I don't know, are they, are they meter sticks? 30, no, 30 centimeter things, and uh, 
he's going to pin it here down at this point. So again, the same basic argument, hey, it's pinned, so you want to do the angular momentums around that point. And he's going to fire in a clay ball in here, and it's going to hit and stick here. Um, and uh, so again, the idea that this clay ball is traveling on a straight line, so again, its line of action is here. Uh, its perpendicular distance is the length of one of these sticks, and that would be the initial angular momentum. It's going to hit, it's going to get this thing to start to rotate, and just as it slams into this thing, it's now going to start to get this thing to rotate. Uh, consider that it hasn't moved much, that this collision happened pretty quick, but it's given a rapid impulse that's getting this thing to set into motion. It's going to end up setting into motion and then it's going to tip up. He wants the minimum velocity that you fire the clay ball. I haven't got this picture drawn very well, but uh, that it's going to tip up. And if you can get it to just to stand up, and uh, just with the kinetic energy just equal to zero on its tip, then it could fall the rest of the way. So to get the V minimum that he needs to fire this clay ball to get it to go up to here and hence fall over, uh, that's what he's looking for. There's really two sets of this. Between here and here, we use uh, conservation of angular momentum. Yeah. Nah, I can't write them. Okay. Then uh, we solve for, in principle, we solve for omega, although we don't know what it is yet. We're going to actually have to come back. Between this step and this step, we use conservation of what? Conservation of energy. Of energy. Okay. And probably you need to work the problem backwards. You need to come back to here. Consider that the center of mass of this thing, this four sticks, has got to be dead center in there. That's got to come over here and that's got to tip up to be uh, a new center of mass up here. So it's got to raise up an mgh and that will be the little h that it goes up. Uh, so you can determine from potential energy back to what the kinetic energy had to be in turn through the conservation of momentum what the mass or the velocity of the bullet had to be or the clay ball. So hopefully that's clear. Uh, this is a, a case where you have to figure out the angular, mo the uh, rotational inertia of these four rods stuck together. So this is a little clever problem. Uh, you've got two of these rods rotating around their end. These other two rods are rotating. You have to use the parallel axis theorem. Uh, you know about the center of mass for a rod. It's 1 12th ml squared. Uh, the, you would use the parallel axis theorem to use this distance d down to the point of rotation. I've got this in my notes, so check it, check it through. But a little bit of trickiness there where he's having you calculate rotational inertia, conservation of energy, uh, momentum, conservation of energy. This is all wrapped up in one problem. Um, okay. Um, okay, I think, uh, uh, I think we'll, we'll call it quits, quits for now. Good luck to everyone on their exam. This is, the, this is kind of the toughest one. Uh, buckle down hard the next day and, and good luck to you. Yeah.